Well, hello, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. Um, my name is Steve Isaacs. I'm going to take a moment to introduce myself and then my um, my partner in crime, Kathy, will uh, introduce herself as well. And then we'll get into some great information about interactive 3D and, and game design and creating the player to create our pipeline and all that kind of great stuff. Um, so like I said, my name is Steve Isaacs. I'm the education program manager at Epic Games. Um, I've been with Epic full time for a little over a year. And prior to that, I had um, started working with the education team while I was still a teacher. I was a teacher for 28 years and ultimately retired about a year ago to come on full time. Uh, at Epic, I have the pleasure of working with, with educators and supporting you know, educators and students by providing resources that essentially help with the onboarding process. Um, some of the tools that we have, you know, people could seem, um, feel that there's a, a, a steep learning curve. Um, we've been trying to very hard to dispel that and make activities and things that make it very easy for both students and teachers to bring these tools into the classroom. Um, so we do that through creating resources as well as um, offering training for teachers. We do extensive professional development for educators um, through a 30 hour professional development um, opportunity that I'll talk about as well. Uh, but like I say, the, you know, one of our big missions is to really get people into these amazing creativity tools to learn industry standard skills and, you know, of course, have a lot of fun along the way. Um, in terms of teaching, I uh, started my career in special education. I taught um, in Montclair, New Jersey, and then I moved to um, Basking Ridge, where I started teaching technology courses. And there I was teaching um, a game design course after school as an after school club, and ultimately also brought that into our gifted and talented program, and really started to see incredible value in teaching kids game design and development, you know, because of the array of skills, not because they were all going to become game developers. And even if they were, you know, it provided these opportunities for them all to play very different roles, similar to what's happening in the industry. So we ended up having a really neat environment that started to feel a lot like a game studio more than a classroom. And uh, it was, you know, phenomenal. And then I guess, you know, so after the after school program proved, you know, to be uh, pretty effective, we moved to um, creating a full game design and development program at the middle school and later at our high school. Um, and through that, and, you know, this is where a lot had changed for me in terms of my view of education, is that I started allowing kids to use, you know, basically any tool that they wanted. Um, I wanted them to have choice in that. I essentially taught the, the primary game design and development concepts. Um, you know, a lot of that has to do with things that are not just the using the tool, but creating a design document, working on um, developing, you know, the prototype of their game, having peers test it and give them feedback, iterating on that process and ultimately publishing a game. For me, that was the part that I was imparting, I felt knowledge where the tool itself was not my biggest concern. I wanted kids to have access to a lot of different opportunities there. So way back, it started with Minecraft and kids wanted to use Minecraft to create their games. And I knew it was important as students. I started to interact with a lot of teachers that were using Minecraft in the classroom. And I you know, kind of took a little leap of faith because I wasn't uh, proficient or you know, an expert by any means in Minecraft, but knew the kids brought that with them. And it was really amazing to, to change my approach to being more of somebody who supported and created the space for learning, but allowed, you know, the students to own a lot of that learning. And it allowed us to have a community of learners, really. It was, um, you know, I was one learner in the classroom, co-learning with my students, um, you know, empowering them to demonstrate their expertise and support their peers. And in so many interesting ways that evolved. And ultimately, um, other tools, including Fortnite Creative came into the picture and, you know, industry standard tools like Unity and Unreal Engine. And, you know, I wanted to continue to give kids these opportunities. And when we started using Fortnite and Unreal Engine, um, you know, I started connecting with Epic, you know, in terms of other educational opportunities and was thrilled that they supported education as they did and um, ultimately even applied for a mega grant, which we'll talk briefly about later and received one. And that's what kind of got me started with 
the team and I'm thrilled to be in the position I'm in now. I love working with teachers. I love supporting what they're doing and seeing the work that their students are producing and all. So very happy to be here with all of you. And um, it sounds like we have a mix probably of people. So it'd be wonderful if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat real quickly who you are, what your role in this process is. Are you a student? Are you a parent? Are you a teacher, an administrator? Um, just so we know who we're talking to. And with that, I will hand it over to Kathy. Thank you so much, Steve. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Kathy Chow Isaacs. I am the education or the or am, I don't know, education specialist uh, with Epic Games and I support the education team and all of its initiatives. So uh, my role, uh, I'll support Steve with the secondary um, professional development, lesson plans, uh, creation of resources. And then I also support um, some industry uh, industry work as well. So post, I mean, post post secondary, so to speak. And, um, you know, people who are already working in 3D and upskilling and whatnot. So uh, I, I have a windy background, which is kind of great. Uh, I have a background in uh, biopsychology and behavioral neuroscience. So I used to do research for Johnson and Johnson. And then, um, you know, uh, Steve and I opened a uh, technology training center way back in the day. And uh, that was really awesome. Was we got to work with people in the community, uh, teaching technology, doing after school camps and um, summer, summer camps, after school programs, all kind of around the use of um, the idea of using technology creatively and um, you know, using games as a means of teaching. So that I think is, has stuck with me for some time because like I've always, when I taught technology and I have, um, I taught technology, elementary technology in New Jersey and New York City. It's always like, well, how could we, you know, uh, include games in the content that the kids were creating and how could we use them for learning. And, and I guess the other thing that I've always been motivated by was like, how do we take these tools that um, are meant for one thing and what else could we use them for? Like what, how and what, you know? Um, you know, maybe we have a word processor, what else could you do with this, you know, just for example. So I, I think that it's really kind of cool to be a part of Epic Games, especially with the tools that we offer, because a lot of people are thinking, well, what else can we do with these tools? Um, so, so yeah, I've all, I mean, my goodness, I think that I'm good. <laughs> if you have any more questions about what I've done, please ask them in the chat. I, I you know, I want to get started with what we're going to talk about. So. Well, thank you. Um, and yeah, please, please use the chat to drop questions in. We're happy to um, definitely hold the Q&A at the end and happy to interject uh, where appropriate with questions as they come in. Um, I am going to share my screen now. Um, and here we go. So, you know, kind of one of the big things we talk about um, in our work is, you know, the player to creator pipeline and really wanting all you know, create opportunities for all students to be creators or content creators. Here's our contact info as well. I'll probably refer back, bring back to this slide um, towards the end, just so you can grab that again, but you're more than welcome to reach out to us directly. So, you know, in terms of Epic Games, you know, what we do, um, we are both, you know, cons you know, a publisher as well as a company that licenses software. Um, in terms of publishing, you know, many of you here today have probably heard of Fortnite. Um, you might even have your own children, students, hopefully even yourselves as players. Um, but it's been quite a phenomenon to see, you know, Fortnite and, and where that's, you know, how that's evolved. And that's a whole other conversation. Um, but we also have published games like Robo Recall, Gears of War, uh, Infinity Blade, uh, Unreal Tournament. And then there are many others coming up that we might even have a hand in publishing that might be created by other developers outside of Epic. Um, you know, and that's and and in that regard, that brings us to sort of the licensing piece where we we license you know one of the uh, industry standard game engines, but that game engine, while initially and often used to create AAA games, and many of the games that 
you know, you're, you're probably seeing out there are created in Unreal Engine. Um, the technology has, has expanded quite a bit to other industries. So we talked about how we license to game developers, but also to people in, in a wide variety of other industries. And you'll, you'll understand that better in a moment. Um, but basically one of the neat things I think about where that came from is that it used to be a different model where we, you know, had this very high, you know, you know, this very sophisticated software for making games. And when we would license it, it would be very expensive to license specifically by companies who knew they were using it to create these, um, you know, these big games and, you know, they would license it. They would get a lot of support. It would be very expensive, but it made it limited in terms of who had access to it. We changed our model um, to, and our most recent model, which I absolutely love, is that there's no licensing fee to use our software until you essentially make your first million dollars on something you would publish with it. So if you want to use the software, it's available, completely accessible. Um, I think what that did, which was amazing, is it got the software in the hands of very many very creative, very innovative people in different industries. And they started to, to leverage the power of that in what they were doing. And that has transformed, I think, this whole you know, use of this tool and even how it's been developed to, to really work for all of these different um, people in these different industries. And we talk a lot, it's really worth um, kind of seeing this awesome video. It's a four minute video that'll answer the question many of you are having if you keep hearing us say interactive 3D, and that is what is interactive 3D? So I'll show this and um, uh, we both love this video. Kathy can never stop talking about how much it's her favorite video. This is um, my favorite video. <laughs> so here we go. Hi, I'm Amanda, a community manager at Epic Games, and today we're talking about interactive 3D. We're experiencing a major shift in the way we work and communicate. We've moved from text and images to video, and now to a world where interactive 3D content is the norm. We're going to explore the technology that powers interactive 3D content and the skills that will be important in this immersive new world. What do we mean by interactive 3D? What we're really talking about is the ability to interact with the digital world the same way you do with the real one. Playing a game like Fortnite on your phone or computer is an example of this. Or it could be a virtual reality or augmented reality experience where you need to use special glasses or hardware to view and take part. But interactive 3D is not just for entertainment. Now we can simulate the real world in a meaningful way. For example, doctors can practice surgery before ever touching a patient. And it's possible to not only simulate what a surgeon would see during the operation, but also how it should feel. Car designers can try out new designs more easily. Usually designers start with a full-size clay model of a new car, and that can cost a lot to produce and take weeks to make. Now they can try out and make changes to their designs in a virtual design space. And we can experience this in our everyday life too. Before you buy a new cool graphic tee, you can turn around a digital version and look at it from every angle, or even customize it with your own colors and designs. So how does this work? The technology that powers all of these experiences is called real-time rendering. This is how the Weather Channel creates realistic simulations of hurricanes and storms that the newscaster can interact with on screen. In a traditional 3D animation, the film you are watching is made up of a collection of static images that are rendered by a computer. Rendering is the process of converting a 3D model to a 2D image. Oftentimes, it can take a computer or a collection of computers days, weeks, or even months to render an entire film. To further complicate things, if an artist wants to make even the smallest change, the entire thing has to be re-rendered. With real-time graphics, the 3D computer-generated visuals that you see are rendered and displayed almost instantly, making it easy for a director to make changes to special effects instantly and collaborate on a virtual set with actors. A real-time engine is the software needed to create these immersive experiences. An Unreal Engine is an award-winning real-time engine. We call it an engine, but it's not like a car engine. It's actually computer software created with code. 
The creation process for Interactive 3D involves bringing 3D models into a real-time engine where behaviors and intelligence can be applied. This can include lighting, materials, physics, AI or artificial intelligence, user interaction, audio, animation, VFX, cinematics, and more. The result is not a simple image, but a 3D world that you can explore and interact with. As you move around, your view of the world changes and you get to see different things, as though you've stepped inside a film. As the industry changes and we start to see interactive 3D everywhere, the demand for people to create these experiences is skyrocketing. Real-time 3D skills are in huge demand. In the future, everyone will be a creator. Want to be part of building this immersive new world? Get started with Unreal Online Learning for free today. All right, so hopefully you see why that is my favorite video. But um, for me, it's like I see so many of our students' interests reflected in the ways that you can use interactive 3D. Um, this is totally their world. Like this is their, their present, right? But so many for, I mean, for us anyway, it's like so much of this didn't exist and, and it's so exciting to be part of this. So in the video, um, many, many industries were represented, right? And I see all our students' um, interests there, right? So as I said earlier, um, and Steve also. So it's like, you know, we have this tool, Unreal Engine, that's traditionally used for games, but then we have all of these other um, companies and organizations saying, but wait, what else can we use this for? Which is like so in line with what, how, the way that I've been thinking about things. So um, things that you saw in the video, um, film and TV, Unreal Engines being used in the automotive industry for broadcast, live events, um, advertising, architecture. Uh, one of the clips was about um, was the Weather Channel using uh, they create simulations uh, for when storms are coming in. You know, just kind of to emphasize the importance of evacuating, right? So they create, they broadcast these simulations, and um, what happened was when they broadcast that one with the tornado and everything, there were people calling the Weather Channel to make sure that the broadcasters were okay. Um, which is, I mean, that's crazy, right? Uh, it's that realistic and that that cool, um, you know. And you see it in many kind, of many places. So let's talk about film and television. Does anybody recognize what's being shown on the screen? I'm gonna have to rely on our good friend Natalie. So I'm gonna. I'm going to use my wait time and I'm going to guess that someone has thrown this in the chat. They're like, oh my gosh, I recognize this. So this is a scene from The Mandalorian um, and The Mandalorian uses a LED wall technology. They actually use a volume to create the, the backdrops to um, their scenes when they're shooting, right? So, um, you know, if we think about what we, what our perception of, you know, creating um, media, right? You might have actors acting to a green screen. And so they have to imagine what they see there. And, you know, if you have multiple actors in the scene, they are also imagining something, but it's not necessarily the same thing. So with um, Unreal Engine, what you can do is you can create the scenes and you can project them right on the green in, in the LED, on the LED bomb, eh, wall in real time. And then if the, um, you know, if the director or anybody wants to make a change, a change can be made on the spot. It can be rendered pretty much uh, instantaneously and put up on the projected onto the LED wall. It's really, really cool. We actually had, and so, you know, usually, what happens is they put in all the special effects in post and post production. So after they're shooting, but now, um, you know, 3D technology is revolutionizing film and TV because they can put 
make those changes on the spot with the actors there and the actors actually see the scenes that they're they're acting in which is really really cool so um just last week we were in la and we had the opportunity to tour nant studios um which has a huge led wall um wall and ceiling it's so amazing and some of the people that we met there one person or two people i think both, they worked on The Mandalorian and they worked on the Marvel films. I mean, I was just in awe and uh, it was, it's pretty remarkable. Um, so that's one of the things that one of the industries that you can enter with this technology. And um, Unreal Engine has been used in over 160 film and TV projects since 2016. You may see some of your favorites here. Um, another that is not actually on this list, uh, The Matrix Resurrections just released earlier this year. That was all three of them plus, um, plus the new was created, uh, used Unreal Engine in their virtual production. Okay, and um, you know, just a sampling of the companies that use Unreal Engine in their processes. Again, you know, whether your students are into cars or Lego or Disney or furniture, I mean, all everything that they're interested in is represented. And one of the things that Amanda had shared in that video is that the demand for these jobs, jobs with these skills is skyrocketing. It's um, outgrowing the market by 600%. Okay, and um, a few years ago, there was some work around the class of 2030 and how we as educators were preparing these students for jobs that would exist, jobs that come, would come into existence when they were seniors. So those kids are now in fourth grade, and I find it so interesting. Like, this is um, a job posting for something that is available now. It's someone who's an experiential designer. So this is a person that blends physical spaces with technology. Um, their jobs, these jobs could be with a theme park or a concert, live events, museums, or, you know, just a, it's like even maybe a mall or some kind of installation like that. And um, you get to interact with the digital as if it were physical. Um, this is, uh, a con I think, one you, Childish Gambino, Travis Scott, they have all done experiences that involve um, some kind of three interactive 3D. Um, and these are some of the similar job titles and some of the knowledge that you should have. Um, there's so many examples of um, Unreal Engine in the real world. Uh, one that is really, really cool is uh, last fall, uh, Balenciaga and Fortnite did a collaboration inside of Fortnite. Um, so this is one of the Fortnite characters and he's wearing, he or she, they are wearing a Balenciaga I think you could buy also. Um, this is one of the billboards that were projected in Times Square. Four billboards were project, uh, were put up. One in London, one in Times Square, New York City, one in Tokyo, and one in Korea. So this is really cool. So if you think about being in Times Square, New York City, you know, this is usually a flat 2D screen. When you see this, this is pretty amazing. Actually, if you wouldn't mind turning down the sound, because that's quite loud. So this guy's just hanging out and then crazy he appears to be coming out of the 2d um uh, billboard which is insane so uh the carolina panthers uh created an experience similar to this at their home opener they had like a a panther kind of jumping around the stadium and tearing apart the opponent's um, banner, and and you'll 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 see you'll start to see things a little bit differently after today. You're gonna wonder, hmm, I wonder that maybe that was unreal. It probably was or is. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some of the ways. Let's see. We're gonna get past this. So. Do you want to talk about this or do you want me to talk about it? 
The thumbs up means you want me to talk. I will, oh, you okay. are. <laughs> Thanks. So that provided some context, like Kathy had said, about some of the different industries and things like that. Um, we have a number of, uh, you know, of, of, of courses and things that students can take to learn more about and get into using Unreal Engine and Interactive 3D. Um, the project that you see here is called Unreal Futures, Careers in Real Time. And we worked with um, X in a Box, who, if anybody has participated or done um, uh, Pixar in a Box, that's a course where you can learn about how the Pixar animators do what they do and all that. It's a really neat opportunity. We worked with that team to create a number of these experiences. So we have one called um, Careers in Advertising. Um, these are all available. You could see these videos online. I'm going to go past the videos, but just talk about the experiences a little. And Unreal Futures Careers in Advertising takes students on a behind the scenes look at the advertising industry and how interactive 3D and real-time technology are truly transforming that space. Um, it's really neat because they we have a number of interviews showing um, an advertising firm called Media Monks, who um, are a big advertising firm. One of the things they do, they work with um, Oreo Cookie. So they talk about how these advertisements are made. And then we have a series of videos that are part of this course where students are guided by a YouTube influencer. Her name is uh, Sonali Singh, she's wonderful. And she teaches students step-by-step -step how to recreate the Oreo cookie ad. Um, and we provide all of the assets and all of that. So this whole project file is available. And one of the really neat things I think is that kids start to see how these things happen. Um, in the past, uh, you know, or I guess for context, Oreo, I think, has about 80 different packagings and flavors for Oreo cookies. So if you're doing an advertisement for a certain market or a certain flavor, in the past, you had to film a second, you know, third, fourth, up to 80th commercial um, in order to achieve that. With this technology, what kids get to experience right in this project is that in order to change from one of the packages to another, they're just really swapping out an asset and all of the work that they've done is still there. So they're now creating the same advertisement, but with a different, you know, artifact. Um, and what we had kids do after this, um, when we first launched this, is we had a competition for creating an Earth Day ad using those same skills they learned in Unreal Engine. Um, and the cool thing is the Unreal Engine is massive but it's used in different industries for different things. So in virtual production, a lot of the skills you need are things like lighting and working with animating the camera using something called the sequencer and that sort of thing. So kids are learning that in this project and then applying those skills to another project, which you know, in your classroom, the neat thing is if you're a CTE teacher teaching all these things and want kids to get involved in, it, in advertising, great. If not, but you want them to understand a little bit about virtual production, they can create a content specific uh, project to follow that, you know, right after that. Oops. Hold on. And also, um, before you play that video, you know, when they swap out that asset, like the wrapper of the cookie package, it's very, it's the same thing as, you know, in a game, if you swap the outfit or your skin, I like calling it an outfit, on your character, it's the same thing. And so it's like translates to the things that they're already doing um, in their day to day. And, um, you know, the, uh, the next project we have um, that just came out, just launched is Unreal Futures Careers in Fashion. And, you know, again, um, kids get a behind the scenes look. Uh, the fashion industry is, again, being totally transformed by this technology in very interesting ways, one of which is digital fashion. So Fabricant, is a company that specializes in only digital fashion. They're the first all digital fashion house um, in the industry. So they talk about what's involved in that and, um, you know, and what they do. And, you know, and other companies like Burberry are involved in this and, and talk about that whole industry. And then kids guided by Sonali again, get to create an interesting, um, you know, runway experience with a garment. And again, all of that is available with the resources we provide and then after they've completed it, they're, the sky's the limit in terms of what other projects you can have them do with those skills. Um, and then upcoming, you know, our next one is going to be Unreal Futures Careers in Animation, which should be super exciting. And that'll be coming out in a bit. Um, but that just gives you a little idea. And then, oops, 
And then um, we're going to talk a little bit about now Unreal Engine and some of the actual projects we have. And this will be also where it'll be a little more relevant specifically to the game design challenge. So we'll share some activities we have that'll help kickstart your pro process if you're going to use Unreal Engine to create your games. Um, but a lot of people, uh, you know, right out of the gate think that you have to code to use Unreal Engine. So that's uh, the first myth we love to dispel. Um, and in terms of that, uh, you can see this scene here. This is a great example of a scene that was built, you know, basically world building is a big part of Unreal Engine, all built with assets from our marketplace. I believe they were all free assets to recreate um, Boulder, you know, an area of Boulder, Colorado. This was all done with basically drag and drop and, and manipulating the scene. Um, no coding in this situation. Um, and technically you could still put a character in and do a walkthrough of it also without coding because some of the assets and models and, and actors are already programmed. Um, then when it comes to the coding side, um, you don't have to know C++ to code in Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine has an amazingly robust um, visual scripting language called Blueprints. Very intuitive, it's node-based, um, it emulates everything you would be doing in C++, but you're able to do it in a context-sensitive manner, which is really great. Um, this little bit of code here is a great example of something you would use in a game, and this comes from one of our projects where basically this code is checking to see as, you, um, as your character collides with a coin, there's a conditional statement to see if it is colliding with the coin. If it is, it, the coin disappears, the variable for having, you know, score or the coins increases and the player continues and that becomes a variable that's stored for their score. So it's dealing with conditional statements, variables, all that in this little bit of code that, you know, if you get in there, makes sense. And we guide kids through doing this sort of thing in, in our activities to get them started. And finally, and this is where the teachers come in. This is, um, you know, I shared a little earlier about my experience teaching. Um, you don't need to be an Unreal Engine expert to teach with Unreal Engine. The goal of our team is to help teachers feel comfortable facilitating and bringing these tools into the classroom. And we do it in a way that allows teachers to really work with very easy to onboard activities that put, you know, a lot of like give students a lot of autonomy in terms of working on these projects because a lot of them have step-by-step -step guides or videos. Um, but the teacher, of course, should have gone through them and should feel comfortable enough guiding the process and supporting students in the classroom. Um, probably more importantly, as time goes on, other students start supporting their peers. And, you know, and, and furthermore, you know, with our activities, once you get through them, the goal is to then go far above and beyond. And a lot of that comes into the hands of the students as well, because they start to understand the environment and know what they want to do. And that's where, you know, they start to guide their own process. So that brings us to, and this is going to be great for a lot of you that are working on this um, game design challenge. So this is our, um, our activity. It's five lessons in creating your first platform game. Um, we have a beautiful asset kit that we had created for this that you can download for free and utilize. Um, and a lot of people are using it for very creative things beyond this activity. But here's how these are set up. Each one of these, and they're, like I said, there are five. Each one has a lesson plan that is teacher facing. So all the teachers on here know that we've got you covered. Um, you know, it has all of the essential questions, the objectives, the learning outcomes, activities, um, you know, the concepts that are being discussed in each one and ultimately even um, assessment criteria with the rubric and standards alignment. So we've got a lot of, you know, um, you know, content here for you as the teacher to guide your process. But then what I really like about this is that we have a student and teacher guide for each one of these. And these are step-by-step -step guides with screenshots and directions that talk students through every step that they need to do. This first one is a neat example of collision detection. So kids get into this game, they're asked to kind of play it at first. They walk over to this first platform and they quickly realize that they're gonna fall right through it, which is not what you're supposed to do in a game. So they then learn how to add collision to that platform and a number of things related to that. And then they test it again, they stand on the platform, all is good in the world. 
and then um, and then the next part of the activity is for them to, you know, duplicate these platforms and create the experience of getting across the whole hallway, which is the first real task in this. And and then they go on, and there are other, um, you know, they learn other elements of both game design and how you know Unreal Engine works and the interface and all that. And as they go through these lessons, the next one has them use the sequencer and create animated uh, moving islands as part of the as a game mechanic. So they create those and then place those in the game. Later, they get into variables and that code that we were talking about with the collecting the coins and getting your score. And later, they also have to find a key to open the final door and all of that. And it leads to finally publishing their game. But um, all throughout, there are opportunities for them to expand on that learning. Like when we do this first lesson, we often have kids then create a simple, whether it be a parkour level or a different, uh, an alternative way to get around, you know, around instead of through the tunnel or what have you. And then after the whole activity, the kids have access to this asset kit as well as a lot of knowledge to move forward and continue to create their own game. So ideally for this challenge, the IGBA challenge, it would be great to think that we would have a lot of games that maybe use some of these mechanics, but looked wildly different because kids got very personal with them and created their own whole world with the asset kit that didn't just stay in the, you know, in the, these five activities in terms of the way it's set up. Um, so that brings us like we've talked about, you know, our sort of um, intent at Epic to support that player to create a pipeline. Um, we start with, uh, and I see Mr. Washburn's here, he likes the term cultural cachet um, when it comes to things like Fortnite. So, you know, we start with the idea that kids are have a lot of interest and agency in a game like Fortnite. They're playing it. They know it was created in Unreal Engine. Um, you know, our first step there is to get them into like something like Twin Motion or Fortnite Creative. Twin Motion is an amazing architectural visualization tool. Some of you might choose to use that to map out your levels as like a prototype, um, but it's used for a lot of other things. But then Fortnite Creative is an environment where you can create an entire game similar to Minecraft. Um, same ideas of, of building and then getting into automation and all that. And then the ultimate goal would be for um, for uh, you know students to become you know users of Unreal Engine and learn those industry standard skills that would um, you know set them up for career opportunities you know potentially even right out of high school. We've been working with some programs that have that lead to apprenticeship programs, so kids learn these skills in school and then they're already set up um, you know workforce uh, apprenticeships and uh, even registered apprenticeship programs in some states that that this feeds so nicely into. That brings us to Fortnite Creative. Um, you know, again, kind of thinking along the line of sandbox game and the opportunity to create anything you'd like. Um, you know, the graphics are beautiful. You have access in Fortnite Creative to all the prefabs of the buildings that, that our students um, know and love in the game. But then you can also take any pieces from those buildings to build your own structures. You can take work from the galleries, which have many, many different um, artifacts that you can bring into your game. Um, and, you know, so that low floor of just building a scenario is, is great. And then the high ceiling we talk about where kids then start to automate things and do really creative, um, you know, things that, that bring in sophisticated game mechanics. Um, one of our activities is an obstacle course, which um, kids create multi-level um, you know, a lot of kids know of them as, or know the term death run as that's a popular game mode in Fortnite Creative, um, which is really an obstacle course. And we teach them how to create those as part of a collision detection assignment or project and, you know, all sorts of others that are similar. Um, also, you know, the fact that you can play Fortnite Creative on so many different devices really lends beautifully to all of this um, for, for the multiplayer support, the cross platform support, um, you know, the fact that when kids are working together in teams, they very organically, you know, develop roles within that and create amazing experiences. And during COVID, this was especially um, great for me when I was, you know, still in the classroom, because when we were doing a project, it sometimes became easier 
for the kids to work remotely on one of these projects because they all had a device they were comfortable with at home that had the game on it versus, you know, in some cases, it was harder to continue to do, you know, sort of a business as usual in terms of the assignments and things for school. Oh, I just wanted to interrupt before you went too far with the Fortnite. We also have, um, uh, for Unreal Engine, we have a new lesson plan series on how to create a block-based game in Unreal Engine. So I'm going to drop that in the chat for you as well. It's pretty, it's a pretty amazing course. So they, uh, kids would be using this series of lessons to create a Minecraft-like game using Unreal Engine. Um, so, so yes, so sorry about that. No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's great. It was created by this educator who actually won our lesson plan competition and it's uh, tremendous. They, you know, it's all object oriented programming. It's an online course that's micro credentialed and, um, you know, is that's a, a level up in terms of um, definitely something you use in a, in a computer science course. And here are a lot of our, you know, similar computer science um, lessons with that same format I showed you with Unreal. They all have a lesson plan. They all have step-by-step -step guides. Um, I love the, um, you know, I love all of these, but the conditional statement ones neat because kids are learning in a very intuitive way about conditional statements in Fortnite, you know, and they're learning the computer science concept without doing coding. And it's very logical. So they need a key to, so we use a slurp fish. So the slurp fish is placed in the game. Um, we set up a conditional button that requires a slurp fish in order to activate it. So if the child or if the student or the player has the slurp fish, then it activates this locking mechanism that in turn unlocks a door. Lends really well to a lot of games kids would want to create like an escape room or other types of things. Um, so that's really great. We have a music activity here where they compose music using the music notes and the sequencer and the sequencer also is a great way of illustrating functions because the sequencer is this big, long or short, whatever, um, you know, kind of volume that you place things in. And when it's activated, it triggers everything in that to happen. So it's like allows you to create these very, very sophisticated functions of things that are going to be happening automatically in, in, um, in the game. And all the, there are some others as well. And then we have a number of um, lesson plans here for specifically for Fortnite Creative. And I'll do another shout out to Mr. Washburn, because I think that first one there, the counterfactuals, their story, your world, is a social studies lesson that Mike wrote that um, is used, actually a few of these are his, <laughs> that, are, that, um, that demonstrate the, the incredible potential for content area work within you know, a, a game, you know, in, a game with game technology. And this, I will show you as a learning experience. It's gonna kind of show you the next level of, I think where we're going with sort of the metaverse and education. And this was um, a collaboration with, um, with Time for Kids. And we uh, worked with them to, uh, this was I think part of a mega grant they received too, to create um, the March Through Time, Martin Luther King experience. And just check this out. This is happening in the game. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation. Let freedom reign from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom reign. I have a dream today. Um, I love that. The when I first experienced that and was in the game and had. Dr. King's speech on the jumbotrons throughout the island and then also walked around and noticed like the civil civil rights museum and stuff in game was pretty great. Um, and that's uh, that's, I think, an example. Of, and, and the interesting thing, too, is I can almost guarantee that some of the people that worked on creating that were probably high school kids from a build team. Um, we've been working with a lot of build teams lately. Um, to talk to them about, you know, so, so like if you've seen like the NBA experience or when they recreated the Super Bowl, the stadium, the Tampa Bay Stadium, um, those are all done by these build teams and they're not something we at the company do. They're typically master builders in Fortnite Creative 
Um, and very honestly, many of them are, you know, still in high school, just out of high school. And it just leads you to see what's possible um, when you get into kind of creativity and, and using these things. Um, and then we also have, and, and you know, some sustainable development um, goals, that, uh, lesson plans that have just been released, and we have a few more of these coming as well. And I do want to leave time for question and answer, but I'm going to take you to um, one of the final slides. Um, Twin Motion is an amazing tool. I'd encourage you to look it up. It's, um, you know, it's relevant to what you're doing with the game design challenge in that you could use it as a prototyping tool, but I wanted to really focus on what was possible with Fortnite Creative and Unreal Engine for this. Um, and all of our tools, all of our resources, and even our teacher training all comes at no cost at all, um, which leads me to this. And this is where I'll end the, the slides and then take questions. But I just want to let you know, especially for the teachers out there, um, we have um, something called the Unreal Educator Accelerator. We offer a 30-hour professional development opportunity. Um, we offer it in a number of different ways. Um, in fact, this summer, we have three really neat opportunities for teachers that might be attending or interested in attending ISTE in New Orleans. We're going to be doing two full days of our accelerator, and the rest will be done online. Um, for people interested in and or thinking of attending Games for Change in New York City, um, we also have a two full day in person with the rest online. And anybody who participates or attends our session will also be able to stay and participate in the Games for Change Festival for the entire festival. And we also have a fully online option, uh, July 18th to 22nd, um, for educators who prefer to learn in the comfort of their own homes um, or are further away or what have you. But um, I think Kathy or somebody will drop the link to our application for that in the chat. And I'll just bring us back to our contact info briefly, just so you have it. And I think that'll be dropped in the chat also. And then I'll stop sharing so we can all see each other. But um, we would love to hear any of your questions and get into that. Watch. What's that? There's a question in the chat. OK. Um, how do you suggest designing a game that cultivates inclusion among play? Oh, gosh, among players in a collaborative way? So I guess the question is, are you talking about a cooperative game or which is one thing we can talk about or about the building aspect of collaboration? Um, if you're talking about inclusion of players in the game, that's a really great question. Um, I think, sorry for the sirens in the background. Um, I think the, when it comes to, that, that's where the creativity of the, of the designer comes in for starters, but we've had, so, We've done things like created um, <laughs> a, ver a variation on a game like Rocket League in Fortnite, just as a test to see what was possible. A lot of people are creating, you know, racing games and things like that in that environment. Um, for the more collaborative, like problem solving, one of our lesson plans is about building um, uh, escape rooms. And that's a very collaborative activity. If, if there's problem solving and puzzles to to you know work with, whether it be working together to find the keys to get out, especially if it's a timed game and that sort of thing. Um, when it comes to the part um, about building together, that part is so intuitive that um, you know Fortnite is built for multiplayer and creative mode is no exception. So <laughs> very loud here. Um, so so players are um, you know. Once one player creates the island, they can invite others into their party to work with them in there. From a building standpoint, I love the potential for collaborative projects. Um, if this game design challenge, which I imagine it would, allows for team entries, uh, that's a great tool for that. Oh, and then there's uh, another question. Mm, yeah. Great, another great question. How yeah. should someone starting the challenge pick which game engine to use? Right. So. Now, if you're talking broader, like in other words, if you're talking Fortnite and Unreal Engine, those activities in terms of those hour of code activities are great starting points to learn the basics of using these tools. Um, if the if we're talking about, you know, on a broader scale, of course, gosh, I mean, 
you know, there's, 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 when I was in the classroom, a lot of that was kids, I gave kids a lot of different options for activities that used these different tools that allowed them before they did their final project, which was a full game, to get exposure to a lot of different tools, and then they would make that decision. Um, so that's, you know, if there's exploratory time for that, I highly recommend it. If it's a matter of one of these tools specifically of interest, those hour of code activities are so well suited for getting started and then understanding the concepts. And then from there, my suggestion would be, okay, now let's build a game design document and come up with the prototype for the game we want using one of those tools. Um, and then it's also a matter of, I mean, Unreal Engine with the way we start them out with, with that project is, you know, definitely eases them into it, but it's a very, you know, very vast tool. Um, so, you know, they're, you know, whereas Fortnite Creative might be an easier starting point, but, um, but both of them are incredible for, for creating game experiences. And Kathy, I think drop, or somebody dropped the link to our Unreal Educator Discord community. That's a community of over 1,600 educators who are all interested in this technology. Um, many who have either been through our accelerator program or are part of, you know, some interest area in learning um, more. So we have, you know, secondary teachers there. We have post-secondary teachers there. We have members of our team. So that's a great place to go for support, and people are quick to answer questions there. Thanks, Mr. Washburn. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. What I'm going to do is wrap up. If there's any other questions, please feel free to drop them. I'm really just helping Steve and Kathy fill, uh, fill any space while you guys. Oh, we've got one. Is the Discord for teachers or can students join? It's intended for teachers. Um, I, you know, being, I wouldn't say that students couldn't join. I'm, I'm all about inclusion. Um, you'll be hanging with a lot of teachers, but um, it's definitely, you know, an opportunity to learn a bit and to kind of see, you know, what other classes are doing and that sort of thing. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today and for that amazing presentation. Uh, it will be available on the IGDA YouTube channel tomorrow, and I'm going to be including all of the links that we've dropped in the Discord, as well as Kathy and Steve's contact information in the video description as well. Uh, so if you have any other questions, they can just contact you both directly or join the Discord to ask those, right? Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, any other parting words before we get offline? No, we're just excited that <laughs> students have this opportunity to participate in this game design challenge. And we love this kind of thing. So, um, you know, hopefully people will reach out. Hopefully they'll, you know, use either these tools or any tools. We want to encourage kids to design games and experiences. Um, you know, you know, what a great way to interact with technology and, and you know, all of that. So, um, yeah, that's we're we're just fully supportive of everything you're doing and excited to be part of it. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so, so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing everybody next week with the opening ceremonies for the Game Design Challenge. Cool. Have a great day, everybody. And bye. Bye, everybody.